you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. Welcome to the big show, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate having you guys all the time. As always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. Because you know what? She never liked you anyway. But to get on her good side, refer to the Chris Voss Show family. Go to goodreads.com, for chess, Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, for chess, Chris Voss, one of the TikTok and the all those crazy places on the Internet. As always, we have the smartest, most brightest people on the show. None of them are me because I'm just an idiot with a mic. We have Claire White on the show with us today. She's got the, her newest book that's out March 3rd. 2024 you've got the power six principles for business success and uh, you can order a book wherever fine books are sold we're going to be talking to her about what's inside of her book and how it can help and change your life claire is an amazon best-selling author and customer experience consultant her 25 years in corporate business with a shopper within the shopper activation sector. She has clients including large grocery retailers and big name brands that have given her experience across a range of business disciplines from developing customer strategy and aligning employees to developing and leading go-to-market plans to improving customer attention and loyalty for her clients and their customers. Instrumental in leading culture transformation in past businesses, she understands the importance of removing business silos, increasing cross-functional collaboration to achieve a common customer purpose and focus to increase business growth. She has a passion to make business more human. That's a good idea. We should do that. Her critical un understanding of elements that make business successful has led to her writing her first book, and she's passionate about helping businesses succeed and improving employee and customer experiences. She now consults working with clients to solve their business problems with customer-focused solutions. Welcome to the show, Claire. How are you? I'm really well, thanks, Chris. That was a great introduction. There you go. I just read what you sent me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Give us your dot-coms. Where can people find you on the interwebs? So I'm on LinkedIn. If you search for Claire White with Connected CX, you will find me. And you can also visit my website, www.connectedcx.org.uk and get in touch with me that way. There you go. So give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside your new book. I've always had a passion to write a book. And after 25 years in business, I left my company and I had the chance to write a book. <laughs> now, I have, as you said, shared just, just shortly ago, I am absolutely passionate about trying to make businesses be more human. Yeah. At the core of business are people. Yes. Whether you're an employee, whether you're a customer, you're a person first, and you have emotions and feelings, wants, needs, desires. And that's, that made me rethink business. Have mm -hmm. we got it right? Have yeah. we, are we approaching business in the right way? And I, I wasn't sure. There you go. Hey, there's always a way to do things better. There's always a way to improve. I think we've moved from this sort of autocrat leadership sort of idea and concepts in business to more of something that's more servant leadership, maybe a little bit more empathetic, some people would say, but more helping people achieve what they want to take and do as opposed to just barking orders at them all day long, which is what we do here at the Chris Voss Show. <laughs> <laughs> Our boys hate us. But uh, tell us a little bit about your history. What was your journey through your career how did you build your life and get involved in running your own businesses? So I would say it's not been linear. <laughs> I think it's a bit, been a bit of a squiggly career. Mm -hmm. Like many people, I had an education. I went to university, not having a clue what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I think many people are like that. I think I'd grown up wanting to be a veterinarian, didn't have the stomach for it or the brains, the science brain. Yeah. <laughs> went to university, history and English. Then I left university, didn't know what I was going to do. So I went and worked in horse racing for three ah, years. There you go. Were yeah. you betting or were you working in the business? <laughs> uh, yeah, a bit both. <laughs> so I worked for a racehorse trainer, probably three of the best years of my life. Yeah. I learned a lot 
it's it's a tough business in horse racing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely learned how to survive <laughs> as a female in an industry that's very male dominated. Um, yeah. Taught me a lot. And then I went and worked in marketing and that's where I started my career. And that's where I really started to become passionate about employees and having a great experience as an employee myself, then as a leader of people. And throughout my whole career, I've always been leading the customer relationship. So with the clients, mm. blue chip companies like P&G, Microsoft, and then big retailers in the UK. And because our services and solutions have always impacted their customers, it's really made me always think about people mm. and what people want and what they need and how to give them a really good experience. And over the past 25 years, if you think about customer loyalty, that's changed, right? I think it's changed. What's your experience of customer loyalty today? Are you loyal? Yeah, I think we're loyal, but I think sometimes we're looking for different things. Like I know the newer generation, they're looking for sustainability and they're looking for companies that give back and companies that aren't creating a lot of waste. There's different things they're looking at now than maybe what earlier companies did. Yeah, 100%. I would say Gen Z, millennials are really conscious, and I think we've got a lot to learn from them, actually, conscious about the environment, conscious about sustainability. And that's putting a lot of pressure around brands and retailers because they absolutely, it's a requirement now. When people are thinking about where they shop and using, thinking about the criteria to decide where they shop, there's so much choice. If you go online, you can literally find um, what you want to buy in probably 20 or 30 places, different retailers offering different things, different experiences, different, they have different values. And I think you will decide as a shopper where you're going to go and shop. But then it's the experience that you have with that business from when you're first searching for the product and you're coming into contact with that business all the way through your journey with that business to becoming an ongoing shopper and continuing that relationship with that business. And I think I became absolutely fascinated by the concept of how customer loyalty was changing and how it was now becoming more about an experience across every single touch point they have with a business rather than just being part of a loyalty scheme mm -hmm. and getting your points when you rock up to your supermarket or getting the coupons that you can redeem. It's more than that now. It's much more than that. And you outline in your book, Six Principles for Business Success. Can you tease out some of the six principles for us? Yeah, absolutely. Spent a lot of time thinking about this, both from my career and the experiences that I've had, but also the books I've read. We all read these business books throughout our career and we all take what we need from them. And, I, and it really helped me to create and build the six principles of business success it is all around purpose. And if anyone's read Simon Sinek, I don't know, you might even have had him on the show. He's an amazing, inspirational guy. His leadership book, but also his Start With Why, is about purpose. People, you have your own purpose in life. You know what's important to you. And as a business, you should have a very clear purpose. And quite a few businesses that I'd seen out there, I think, had lost a bit of their purpose. Mm. So one yeah. of the very first principle from my perspective was having a really clear purpose and to accompany that peer purpose, having this amazing, inspiring vision, this dream of what you want your business to be, that your employees can really get behind and aspire to and align behind. And it gives them kind of a North Star, a guiding star to drive their experience with your business because they're really clear on what you want to achieve and they get behind it. Second is around, it's a bit of the dry chapter, it's around having a really robust business model for success underpinned by a business plan and that is the strategy for your business it's how you're going to make money what your product service is the partners you're going to work with the revenue streams you're going to have how you're going to market it how you're going to sell it um and i use a lot of real life examples of businesses that are now hugely successful but most of them started in someone's garage they so started in someone's garage the apple where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started in Steve Jobs' garage. I think Jeff Bezos also started in the garage. It seems to be a bit of a theme. They had a really robust purpose and vision, followed by a business model for success that under, was underpinned by this plan. And if you are a fan of Apple Inc., I am, <laughs> I think many people are, you can actually go and uh, online and you can find the business plan that they created to get investment for that Apple III computer back in the 70s. And it's a fascinating reading. If you like a bit of history, I recommend you go and read it. 
Yeah, it definitely is because a lot of startups start that way. They start on a shoestring budget. They can't get early financing. My two early companies, we started on a shoestring budget with lots of sweat equity and very little cash. I think the first company we started with two thousand dollars and then a year and a half later we started one with four thousand dollars and and a lot of it was sweat equity so it was us sweating and working and doing all the things <laughs> the great thing is you grow pretty fast coming out of that where you can have you can have really you can scale really fast you can use your profits to fund your company because you're not funding debt and you can be pretty successful and that that can make all the difference in 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 scaling especially if you're not in debt hawk up to your ear balls that that can make all the difference in the world as well a lot of these principles are really important in taking a look at your business and how you build them and what you talk about in your book with the company that you have that you run do you do consulting or do you do coaching or how do you engage in helping businesses do what they need to get done so it is consulting. So I help businesses solve problems with customer experience, pro- customer experience solutions. So I hadn't actually finished my own principles of my book. I've got a few more to share. If that's okay, okay, please do. I was just saying, if you want to tease some out, sometimes people will tease a few, but you're welcome to, to give us all yeah. so we can. Um, so business is about customer experience and throughout the book, mm-hmm. if you read it, I think you'll find that there are, it is a theme that runs throughout each principle. So for example, when we're talking about purpose and vision, in that purpose and vision, there should be your customer somewhere if you think about amazon they've just actually reviewed i guess reinvigorated their vision i think in 2021 they've recreated a vision that was to be the earth's most customer-centric business and the earth's best employer in the mm. earth's safest workplace mm. so it's really inspirational and it includes the customer it includes the employee and I think businesses can learn from, from this and really start thinking about where in my purpose and my vision is my customer and my employees. These are the people that are going to make my business successful. Without them, I don't have a business. So I think throughout each principle, and I think there are another another four, so do read my book because it would be great for you to learn from them. But they are all about employees, leadership culture. I'm very passionate about culture. And I think culture is becoming more important in businesses today than I think it maybe was in the past. Yeah, I have a look through. I'm really, I've just recently written an article actually on uh, customer experience and how it's linked to employee experience and how you can't really have one without the other and actually how all of them are wrapped up in strong culture. And I'm seeing businesses now are thinking more and more, much more about culture and getting back. There's the old quote, isn't there? Culture eats strategy for business. I think that's a Peter Drucker credited co- co- yeah. quote. Yeah. Uh, and I think businesses can should really focus on getting that right. And all of the companies I talk about in my book have done that right. There you go. So you've got plenty of examples of success models in there. It, it, that's so important. Years ago, I'd read Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, and I used the workbook in our offices, the second book that followed that. And the important thing was is creating that culture from the outset from the beginning of the company, or I suppose you can do a reset if you come in as a CEO to a company that's already established and do that. But setting that culture that comes from your leadership too as well can make all the difference because the culture is representative of the values of the the CEO, the leader, but also the values of the company. And you've got to walk the talk. You can't just put out a PR thing saying, hey, we have some values. Here they are and not live them because people will be like, hey, you're full of shit. You're not living your values. But uh, you've got to have that culture because people, it gives people a containment system to live within where they can go, okay, we know our values. We know what we're trying to do. We know what the objective here is. It's just not basically, hey, we're all going to slave away for 40 hours a week and then uh, make money for the company. (laughs) <laughs> That's it. And sorry yeah it is about getting the leadership right and leading mm-hmm. by example consistently because so many companies i think talk the talk they don't walk the walk Mm -hmm. and that's when you get people leaving the business because they're not seeing that their values are being consistently lived and values are becoming so important to people nowadays much more than i think they used to and having alignment Mm -hmm. with who your employer is and what they're doing yep it's a thing where that people want more out of life. I think a lot of people woke up with COVID and said, am I doing what I really love? If this is what I want to do, am I doing what I really care about, what I really love? Is this is really what my life's journey should be about? And, and I think that's been an issue for a lot of people 
where they they just have hit a wall. And so a lot of people started searching here in America. We called it the Great Resignation. Did you guys have that over on your side of the pond? We did. We did. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think the number one reason was work-life balance, burnout. Yeah? And I think it's probably the same over there people were starting to realize work-life balance was so important. And I think during COVID, particularly, people were working at their homes. Some of the people weren't used to working on their own at their home for 20, 24 <laughs> seven. And that put people under a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that definitely happened. I think it was a bit of a global phenomenon that, and uh, we definitely need to be learning from it. I think that was a pivotal point for, in terms of employee kind of workplace relations. And I think employees started to realize they wanted more and they needed more. In the UK, we've got a big movement of four-day week. Oh. So, have you heard of that? Yeah, we've been. it's been kicked around over here on this side of the pond. I'm a proponent for it because I don't feel people are productive as much as they can. For 15 years, we've been watching people watch our videos at work and consume our stuff at work, and we're like, "What? do you guys do any work over there? Yeah. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of... I, when I used to work at companies 30 years ago or something, I there was a lot of mucking about that I was doing to kill time. I don't, I just don't think it's productive anymore. And I think that's what we found with sending people home and doing remote work for the time being. I think there's a balance in there somewhere. But a lot of people did look at, you, you're right, a lot of people did look at their life balance. And some people looked at their family and said, I really would like to spend more time with these people. It's a little bit more challenging, but it saves me on child support, which is pretty expensive here. I'm sure it is over there now. Uh, over here, it's pretty much gotten to be one person's wages. And then it's more quality time. People said, why am I going to a job where if I live in LA, it's basically two hours to work and two hours back. So four hours of my day, I'm stuck in a car to go for to a job that I work eight hours in. How does this make any sense? Yeah. Some people, of course, everyone around them went, why do I like these people? <laughs> I go to work to avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think people just reevaluated their life. And I think yeah. that it's definitely improved. We talk about hybrid working now as well, where people have the opportunity to go. I think some people are made to go into the office so many days a week, but mm -hmm. they can work from home as well. So there's a bit, it's a bit more flexible. And I actually saw a Simon Sinek article where he was talking about, I used to, he used to say, I don't want people working over the weekends. But actually now he's saying if people really want to work, but maybe they take some time off in the week. It's making it more flexible because everyone's different. Everyone's work schedules and life patterns are different. Maybe we should be really totally flexible and leave it up to people to decide. At the end of the day, an employer has to trust their employee. Mm. And as long as they're getting the work done, why shouldn't they? And maybe that will just increase the kind of longevity that those valuable employees have with their respective employee employers. That's very true. It's an interesting thing what we're dealing with remote work. And there's still a lot of clawback, what we call clawback, that people are still trying to do. Where they're like, hey, we need a clawback from this, that, or the other. We need to get your employees working from home because this is really important. And that's a big deal. It's It really is pretty wild in, 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 having, that, in having that happen. So yeah. <laughs> what are some of the other issues maybe we haven't touched on that or teased out that are in your book? So we've, we talked about customer experience. I think innovation, agility and adaptability, when you're going back to COVID, was something that was really important for businesses. In the UK, we used a word often called pivot. That was used in the US. Yeah, yeah. Pivot. Companies were literally having to pivot. They were having to rethink their businesses. Restaurants, bars were shut. People couldn't go there. They had to rethink, enable there to be takeaway. It was a totally new business model for them. And that's just one example. And then there were other businesses that weren't able to do that. They weren't adaptable. They weren't agile. And they went out of business. And it's devastating. So I think having that agility, and obviously we've got, you've got the agile project management process as well, which I think is enabling you to get products out there more quickly with the minimal viable product to the market quicker, reiterate and then adapt and improve your products. And that is, is really making huge changes uh, to, to businesses. And if you look at all, all the businesses I talk about in the book, for example, Google, Amazon, Apple, yes, they're massive businesses. They weren't once. How they got there was because they kept innovating. Yep. They kept innovating, reinventing themselves as a business, reinventing and innovating on their products and their offering. 
And when we talked about in, talk about innovation, we're not just talking about inventing or reinventing products or services or making and improving them, making them better and improving them. We're also talking about the processes in businesses, rethinking processes as well as a new products and new product development. And I think when I talk about customers, innovation should always be customer led. You've got to consider your customer if you're going to redevelop a product or redesign a product. There has to be a need, a customer that really wants this new innovation. Mm-hmm. And then that, just another example of how everything starts with customers. And I really hope businesses that aren't putting their customer at the forefront when we're thinking about strategy at a broad level really start to do that. Uh, it's starting to happen more and more, but it's still not where it needs to be. Definitely. There's, I see so many products that you're just like, did anybody test this at the customer level? One of the things I used to talk, teach people is test your business model and test your throughput. I used to randomly call into my office unannounced and without caller ID to see how my operations were working. So I would play like I was a customer. I'd test the receptionist and then ask for assistance or help and then get passed around the system. There's an old story, and I think it was, I think it came from a Tom Peters book, but I'm not sure. I can't remember. But basically, there was a major company that made TV dinners and frozen dinners that were made to eat. It might have been Stouffer's. And basically, they couldn't understand why sales were down. People weren't buying their product. And one day, they were were mucking about at the boardroom trying to figure out, why aren't people buying and eating our product? And one day, the CEO said, you know what, we're going to we're gonna eat our own lunch. We're going to find out what's going on. So they started having the TV dinners cooked and delivered to the boardroom meetings. <laughs> right away, they all figured out why no one was eating their crap because oh. it tasted like crap. And they, they just sat there just going, oh, my God, this is what we're selling? This is what we're doing? Yeah, no, no wonder sales are down. And they weren't being like you said, customer centric in thinking about what their customer's experience was. And that's just so important. If you don't do that, you're not going to, you're not going to take and get it. And it's amazing to me how many businesses do that. I just got, I just yelled at a company recently that had a software problem in their systems that were costly and embarrassing. And I couldn't figure out why it was something that has worked for years and suddenly stopped working. And I couldn't figure it out. And logically, it wasn't figuring out either as well. It was clearly a software issue. And when I contacted the customer service, their customer service was just passive about it. It was like, we really can't do anything more than just let us know when you have the problem. We'll see if we can fix it. And I'm like, it's a product that I have to go live for. It might be the one we're using right now. And I can't really call in customer service when I'm live on a show. Mm. And, and so I had asked them, I said, you, can you get on me? Can we create a fake live and we'll go on and you can test what's going on? Oh no, we're not allowed to do that. That's not, it's not something we're allowed to do. And I'm like, how do you run a product that sells live stuff? How yeah. do how did you how do you not be able to do that if and so they couldn't do it. In fact they jerked me around where they left me on hold for a while saying they were gonna do it, but then they couldn't do it, and they were gonna do it, and they couldn't do it. And finally I, after half an hour I just went, whatever, man. And the people in the customer service are the same limitations that were just ignorant towards customers. Whereas we everything looks fine on our end. And I've heard that so many times, especially with cable providers. Everything looks fine on our end. Can you reset it? Oh, sure. And they reset it. And you're like, oh, yeah, see, it works now. So it was on your end. And they're like, that, oh. That experience is horrific. Yeah. That made you feel. Do you want to now oh, find an alternative dude. product? I was pissed and told them I'm billing them for 10 grand because I fixed, because yeah. I've discovered their problem, which isn't my business to do. And that happens so many times where I fix people's technical problems by just A B testing, simple testing that a customer service could do, a customer agent could do with me. So in this example, I went into the audio and turns out that where we've had the audio set for years in a slider bar, if you slide above 50% on their software, it will turn off the mic and the mic won't work, even though it's giving feedback in the testing that the mic is working. But if you leave it at half, you're fine. 
So somewhere, someone changed their software to where it didn't work past a half percent. I had to do this through wasting my time A-B testing. So I was quite pissed. And the customer service was just extraordinary. In fact, they didn't even bother replying once I told them, I gave them a piece of my mind and told them how much time they wasted. Partially because I told them they owe me about 10 grand for six, fixing their stupid ass problem. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if they fixed it at this point, but there you go. But yeah, that's an example of where, and I've sent a letter to the CEO too. I'm like, have you ever called your customer service and seen what a shit show it is? A lot mm-hmm. of these tech companies, that's what they do. They think of customer service last. They're developing their riches first. They think of customer service last, and then Mm -hmm. they've never gone through their experience. I doubt any of them have ever called the customer service 1-800 number or gone through the live chat system to even see if it works. They just, I'm sure it's working. We paid some company to handle it. I'm sure it's fine. It's just shocking. It's just shocking. I think you're right. I think, have you heard of Steve Blank? That sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, Steve Blank, he's basically the startup guy. So he's created a lot of startups himself. He's written a few Mm -hmm. books all about startups and how to have the right startup model because he's identified, like you said there, that startups generally focus and tech companies focus on innovating and building their product, Mm -hmm. their product mindset first. They don't think about their customers. They don't think about how they're going to service their customers. They're just thinking about the product and getting it to market. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's written this book around there is a specific business model for startups that for, they that literally start with the customer and end with the customer yeah. uh, because it's so often that they don't do this and obviously you've experienced that yourself that mm. you've had a terrible experience that because the business just hasn't put any focus in that area and there's a lot of startups that fail because they don't focus on the end user the customer and they build some product that they're they think is kitschy or they're like this is a great idea we should do this and you're like have you run that by any customers no no it's uh we're disrupting so thereby it must be a billionaire company and you're like i don't know what you're disrupting because it doesn't seem like there's a demand for that but you'll find out (laughs) fuck around and find out (laughs) as it were (laughs) But you're right. These are a lot of things that come into it. Let's plug your website again and talk about what sort of services there you offer to companies and executives that might be listening. So I am, my specialism is employee experience and customer experience. They're two areas I'm really passionate about and I've got a whole raft of experience in. My consultancy is Connected CX. We are helping businesses today improve their, the experience their customers receive. So if your business is experiencing customer churn, so if you're losing customers, your customer metrics like net promoter system or customer satisfaction scores are declining, your employee morale is declining, your attrition is increasing, all of the negative business metrics around your customer and employee, then I can come and help, my business can come and help you to diagnose the root cause of those problems and put together some kind of customer and employee centric solutions to solve them. It might be a retailer who is wanting to improve their experience in their retail stores. It could be a manufacturer looking to improve the experience of their b2b clients it at literally if you have a customer regardless of b2b or b2c then we'll be able to help you and ultimately i think the important thing to to point out with customer experience is it's not a fluffy thing i think because as soon as you mention emotion your board loses interest. But actually, it is about emotions. It's about connecting with your customers and your employees. And unfortunately, you do need to consider emotions in that. And so I help engage stakeholders by talking in kind of business terms with them, the metrics that are really going to be dialed up by the solutions that we present to them and how we move them forwards. There you go. And people buy off emotion. Yeah. They buy off of, sometimes it's fear of missing out or fear of loss or fear of, hey, I need this. Or sometimes it's for pleasure. Hey, I need to buy this because it makes me feel good. Like a bag of Oreos. Don't do that, people. Yes. Don't eat the whole bag too at one second. <laughs> like I do. We, pleasure and pain is what motivates us and, yeah. and those feelings. And then feelings of loyalty too. I have a lot of brands that I buy and I buy like all their products because I'm very loyal to them. I trust them. I feel good eating them and they're like, I have a workout protein brand called Naked Nutrition and 
they basically, the reason they call it Naked Nutrition is it's just the product itself. It has no fillers to it. So in the protein business, and they have some other supplements in the that are, they have it down to where it's eight ingredients. And they call it Naked because it basically is very clean. There's not fillers. There's not junk in it. There's not 50,000 things on the back of the box you can't read with names of ingredients. It's yeah. just down to five to eight different ingredients and i really like that because i've taken protein that's some of the junk and you're looking at the back of it going how i can't even pronounce what the hell's in this bottle and i'm not really sure any of it's good for me and so i buy like all their products i have a loyalty thing and so yeah there's emotion part of it like you said where i'm bound to the, my loyalty in this product because it makes me feel good and I'm, I'm supporting the company. I'm, I'm believing them. I've probably spent thousands of dollars with them. There's a whole new shipment of crap that's supposed to be delivered today. And uh, But yeah, people buy off emotion. Emotion is what motivates people to pull that dollar out of their pocket, slap it down on the uh, table and, and say, I'll shut up and take my money. <laughs> That's it. They, and also, I think you, they're not going to let you down. You trust that product to do mm. what it says it's going to do. Yep. Um, and I think if you think of other big brands that have, I think have really achieved customer loyalty, I think it's a rare thing these days, it's things like Harley Davidson. Yep. So, you know, if you bought a Harley Davidson, you probably will never buy anything else again. Yeah. You, know, you are a Harley D Davidson devotee. Mm. I think I would say I am an Apple loyalist. I always buy everything I have is Apple. Mm. I know I'm going to get great treatment when I go into an Apple store. I know I'm going to talk to experts. I know they're going to solve my problems. It's about the, knowing that you can trust them, knowing they'll fix things if things do go wrong, because sometimes they do, but they get fixed very quickly and very easily and painlessly. Knowing that you're always going to get what you expect from them. You're not going to let you down. Um, and knowing that they know you. They know what you buy from them. They know what you like. They make recommendations that you're going to buy and that are going to interest you. They're not going to try and sell you something that you're never going to want. And I think it's mm -hmm. these types of things that make you loyal to a brand. Oh, definitely. Totally. It can make all the difference in in the world. And yeah, Apple has been really good at that where they build a, what's the, word, what's the words they use? Culture, environment. They build an ecosystem. That's the ecosystem, word I'm looking for. Yeah. yeah. So they build an ecosystem where you are, there's so much support there, but it's, it's almost kind of like a giant trap because you're like, I really can't leave uh, Apple because uh, my email's there, my my, my Apple TV is there. My Apple audio is there. My iPad's over there. The kids' fan, iPads are over there. It's like a giant ecosystem, yeah. which works pretty good most times. Sometimes it doesn't work well. Like I had a friend who cheated on his wife, and he didn't realize the text between him and his new yeah. girlfriend were going to his family account on the Apple computer. And so his wife was reading them in line. <laughs> So, sometimes you might want to stick with an Android. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ouch. <laughs> What's the old line I used earlier? Fuck around and find out. So there you go. <laughs> so, sometimes if you tempt the devil in life, you're going to get the horns. Yeah, absolutely. As they say. Give us your final pitch on people to pick your book and work with you in your dot com as we go out. If you are a leader in a business that is stuck, if you're an entrepreneur who's thinking about how to build the base bones of your business to scale, there is some really clear guide, practical guidelines in my book based on kind of experience and all the research that we've done. Lots of stories. If you just like stories, there's lots of stories about big brands and leaders in this book. And if you want to contact me on my socials, do get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I share a lot of articles and in just information, adding value and content. And I like to get into discussion with my network as well. So it'd be great to get a conversation going. There you go. People have a fun time. It sounds like you got your finger on the pulse when it comes to customers. Thank you very much, Claire, for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. I ordered up the book wherever fine books are sold. It's called You've Got the Power, Six Principles for Business Success out March 3rd, 2024. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss. Chris Foss won the TikTok and the Ellen's crazy place on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time.